12% of all adults in Houston are living with diabetes. It's the leading cause of death in the U.S. Houston Health Department data also indicates that Houston's Hispanic and black communities are disproportionately aff affected. Joining us to explore the topic is Dr. David Purse, Chief Medical Officer for the City of Houston. Good morning, Dr. Purse. Uh, good morning, Haley. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, thanks for coming on and, and tell us just why do you want to talk about diabetes this morning? Just tell people how big of a problem this is in Houston. Well, as you pointed out, it's, you know, it is a leading cause of death, um, along with heart disease and cancer. It's right up there with the, the other big causes of death in the United States. And 12% is not a small percentage. It's a, it's a, it's a major percentage. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's a couple of different forms of diabetes. We'll talk about that in a minute, but <clears throat> some of it, you know, you, you're born with and some of it you can actually avoid with the right habits. Mm -hmm. So talk it's important that we all talk about it. Talk more about how per pervasive diabetes is in the black and Hispanic communities. So you pointed out that 12% across Houston, 12% of people have got uh, diabetes. If you look in our predominantly African-American neighborhoods, for example, Clinton Park and Setagas, that number it nearly doubles. And if we look in some of our predominantly Hispanic or Latino communities like Magnolia Park, it's at 18%, Denver Harbor, it's at 17.5%. So those are significant increases. And let me also point out, this is not a Houston-specific phenomenon. This is seen across the United States in, you know, in some of our racial and ethnic communities that they seem to have a, a greater likelihood to suffer from diabetes. So you're talking about specific neighborhoods that I'm assuming that the health department has studied or looked into? Yeah, these are these data that I just gave. This comes from our uh, investigation here locally. But I, as I pointed out, that you'll find the same trend across the nation. Uh, there seems to be a, a little bit of a perhaps a genetic predisposition, but there's also we need to talk about there, there's also some environmental things which will uh, impact uh, ethnic communities to have greater rates of diabetes. Oh, interesting. So tell us about diabetes, how it interferes with normal blood sugar levels. Like, what's it doing to our insides? Yeah. So most of the foods that you eat, in order for your body to use that that uh, energy, that, that food, it, it converts it to sugar, glucose. Just you know, so pretty much everything you eat gets converted uh, to glucose. But not all foods are converted the same at the same rate. For example, now your pancreas creates insulin, and insulin is a hormone that allows the glucose to get from your blood into the cells. It's like a key that opens the door that lets the sugar get into, into the cells so that your cell can then use it as an energy source. And with diabetes, either a person doesn't make enough insulin or they can't use the insulin that their body does make. So type one diabetes is where your body generally doesn't produce enough insulin. And this is something you're generally born with. We see this runs in family lines and you just don't produce enough insulin. Most people are diagnosed with type one insulin uh, I'm sorry, type 1 diabetes before the age of 20. Type 2 diabetes is different. Type 2 mm -hmm. diabetes is where your body becomes a little numb, if you will, to the insulin and it doesn't use it very effectively. And so then your body starts producing, you know, higher amounts of insulin, but it still it doesn't respond as well. This is something which comes upon over years and years of probably having a lousy diet quite honestly. And so this is diagnosed people over the age of 30 who are overbeast, and sometimes people over the age of 45 can get and they don't have to be obese. obese. Mm -hmm. um, that also tends to run in families, but I, I wanna point out something I was hinted at earlier is that you know, your diet in the first 30 to 40 years of your life really has a, uh, an impact on whether or not you may develop type two diabetes in later years. Yeah, diet, but what else would put people at risk? I mean, is it simply being of these ethnic minority groups too? So, um, you know, part of it is diet and the other part is activity. So, uh, you know, you can be in, being overweight. And, and again, this goes to the poor diet. So, if you, you know, we live in a world today where it is so easy to get snack foods. Well, snack foods, they, they're, uh, they either have a lot of sugar, you know, clearly on them, right? They've got a frosting on it or, or they just, they, you know, they, 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 they're very sugary to begin with. Or they're made with highly refined um, uh, components that will your body will quickly turn into sugar. So let's take example, like just a slice of plain old white bread. So white bread is highly refined. Your body will quickly turn that into sugar. Even though there's no sugar in that white bread, your body will make sugar of it quickly. Whereas if you take a slice of, of whole grain bread, your body will turn that into sugar eventually, but it takes much, much longer. And the difference is with the white bread, you're gonna get a big spike in your sugar, which will cause a big insulin release. And then it's those repeated big insulin releases that makes your body become numb to it, 
where if you had had a diet with more fiber content and the more whole grains, you don't get those spikes and your body remains very sensitive, appropriately sensitive to the insulin. So it's both being overweight, um, uh, exercise has a huge uh, impact on this. The more you exercise, the better your body will respond to those uh, the food that you take in and manage your sugar level level better. So it's it's complicated. It's it's a couple of things. And of course, yes. And and it appears that being African American or Latino Hispanic, that there is some sort of a genetic overlay to that that actually makes it even a little bit more uh, uh, problematic. What what would be the typical symptoms if somebody did have diabetes and say they they weren't diagnosed yet? What would their symptoms be? So think of it this way. You've got a lot of sugar in your blood, um, too much sugar. Your insulin, either you don't make enough insulin or it's not able, you're not able to use the insulin, so it can't get it into your cells. So your kidneys respond by trying to get rid of all that extra sugar. So you're going to urinate a lot. So you'll find one of the symptoms is frequent urination. Well, if you're urinating a lot, guess what? Then you're going to be thirsty because now you're getting dehydrated. So urinating a lot, feeling thirsty. And then again, remember, your cells, they never got that sugar into the cell to use it, so you're gonna feel like you're hungry, even though you just got done eating. And in addition, because the cells aren't getting the sugar they want, you become fatigued. So urinating a lot, feeling thirsty, feeling hungry, even though you ate, fatigued. It also impacts your vision. And then the other thing is that, you know, cuts and bruises, they're slow to heal because again, those cells are struggling to get by your, your skin cells. And then, you know, one of the things that's a little bit odd about this is that, you know, with type one diabetes, sometimes people will experience an unexplained uh, weight loss. And then with type two and actually type one diabetes, eventually the nerve endings in your fingers and your hands and your uh, feet, they'll start to dysfunction a little bit. And you're gonna get tingling, numbness, or you mm -hmm. may get pain. Well, a lot of people do still go many years without getting a diagnosis, without seeing a doctor. What would happen if you're somebody who does, just goes a long time without treating diabetes? So the, the sugar uh, really is an irritant to the lining of your blood vessels. And so this is why we see higher rates of heart attacks and stroke. And also I talked about that numbness and tingling the hands and feet. Some people will you know, develop uh, severe problems with uh, uh, blood flow to the hands and feet, and we we hear about you know what well, we see patients with diabetes um, losing their their feet because yeah. they they have to be amputated because that microcirculation is uh, doesn't get there and and tissue starts to die. Mm -hmm. but the big things are heart attacks, and strokes, and then you know the peripheral amputations. It can also, like I said, it impacts your vision uh, quite significantly. We've had a lot of folks who become blind as a result of diabetes. The consequences are serious. Dr. Purse, um, just quickly, because asking people to change their diet, to change their lifestyle once you have a diagnosis can be a really abrupt change for a lot of people. Where can they get help managing their diabetes? Yeah, excellent point. So the Houston Health Department offers a what we call our Dawn or Diabetes Awareness and Oh, Diabetes Awareness and Wellness Network. Uh, we've got four locations across the city and it's really focused on helping people who have been diagnosed with diabetes, how to change their daily habits to have a healthy lifestyle to minimize the impact that their diabetes may have. We offer cooking classes, there's physical activity classes, we've got pre-diabetes and prevention classes. Some people will be diagnosed being pre-diabetic. Your doctor pay attention to that and jump mm -hmm. on that. Um, all you have to do is call 832 393-6700, and uh, we'll get you registered and get you to a location that's near where you live. All right. Sounds like maybe I need to go out and do a story with Don too. That sounds like a good organization. Thank you, Dr. David Purse. We always appreciate hearing from you on a Monday morning.